I'm like, is this a step? All I'm thinking about is yesterday when I almost fell off. No. I'm not going out there. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. You can hear me. Everybody hear me? I know, if, if the people in the back don't say anything, I know they can't hear me. So everybody, and it's clear? Yes. <laughs> thank you, okay. Thank you so much for being here and thank you to those of you who are joining us uh, remotely. This is one of my favorite events of the year and not just because I do all the talking. <laughs> it's because we work so hard every day to make sure that Stevens College continues to, to provide the absolute most extraordinary, best college education on the planet. And everybody here gets up every day and comes to campus determined to make this a better place for our students. And once a year, I have the privilege of standing before you and before those who, have, who are either now with us or will be because it will be online, to talk about that hard work, to give you a clear idea of the extraordinary challenges we face as a college, as an undergraduate college, as a women's college located in Columbia, Missouri, in a higher education environment that is not only changing at light speed, but represents in so many ways the greatest challenge to higher education, certainly in my history, but I would argue perhaps even in the history of American higher education. So my hope is that you leave this today. First of all, it's gonna be like a flyby. It's just gonna be like whoosh, because there's so many things I want you to know. I don't expect you to, if you're thinking, what did she say? Oh my, that's okay, don't worry about it. This is really a first impression sort of dot. You know, what I'm trying to do is a bunch of data points and then in your head, I'm hoping you're gonna put them all together and come away with a picture. And that's the idea. It's not a lecture, it's a show. <laughs> right, you know your president. Uh, but I'm here and I'm of course happy to answer questions. Uh, we have an hour 15. and 15, which is a long time to listen to anybody show you slides, but I know how deeply you care. So I'm gonna count on your attention. I do wanna start by acknowledging, and I hope I remember to do it constantly, but I'm certainly gonna do it first and last. And that is I need to acknowledge, and I am so grateful for the incredible work that I just talked about, that everybody associated with this institution here in Columbia work, contributes, is dedicated to, is committed to. It's a challenge. And again, we come here every day determined to do everything we can. I'm gonna go through so many things and it's gonna be like, and another thing, and another thing. And none of those would happen, none of them, without the extraordinary teamwork and commitment and dedication that we have here. And so I'm gonna start by asking my team to stand up. I have the most remarkable, unbelievable team. Come on everybody, stand up. Leslie, Laura, Dane, Jarrell, Shannon, Lita. I'm telling you, we're a family. You know, I mean, <laughs> I couldn't do it and, and wouldn't do it without them. And they get so much credit because they work with me every day. <laughs> and I come in, I'm like, oh, I have, the, yeah, yeah. And that's sort of, I don't always sound like that, but sometimes I do, right? <laughs> and I couldn't do it and wouldn't do it without without them, so, so grateful. I also wanna acknowledge and thank the board. Uh, the, the, yes. I, three of them are here today. I'm thanking all of them. I hope you're watching. Um, Ann Murphy, four, sorry. One, two, three. Oh, Anna. Anna and Stacy, five. Oh my gosh, sorry. Eh, five, five of them. Stacy, Anna, Ann, Nancy, and Sarah. Members of the board, Ann is our board chair. Please stand up and let everybody thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I, I really do wanna also call out Ann. 
Ann Murphy, you know, I always say there's a reason and a season for leadership. And Ann is exactly, exactly the board chair we need and I need, I need as we go through this transition. The board says yes first. And when I come in and say, we're gonna change the way we do everything. And they're like, okay. <laughs> because they believe in the future of the college and they recognize where we are. But we couldn't do it without them. And I couldn't do it without them. If it weren't for the fact that they trust that we will achieve and we will execute. I always say, the world's full of big ideas, God's in the execution. Um, and they trust that there's a God out there somewhere and, and we're gonna execute on it. So deeply grateful. And the last thing is I just need to thank the, the folks who work here, our staff, our amazing staff for reunion. Can we do that? Hello, everybody from Advancement. You know them, right? It's, it's been extraordinary. It still is. Um, and, and our faculty. You know, I gotta tell you, faculty have this terrible reputation of being difficult to work with. There's a reason for that. I mean, in the world, just like all stereotypes, there's little tiny bits of somewhere in there that something came out that sort of started that narrative. And, and they can be difficult to work with. Our faculty are amazing about their willingness to consider change. They, we wouldn't be here. We would not be here when, and Leslie, who's led the way, goes to them and says, so here's the thing. We're thinking maybe we're gonna change your schedule, like a lot. <laughs> and they're like, okay, right? And in, in 18 months, they not only have come around, but so many of them have truly embraced and are excited about where we're headed. And every time we have a, a family on campus, a prospective student family on campus, and we talk about it, and without exception, they are like, yes, this is gonna be great. Every time that happens, it is, it's a little bit more of a like, okay, this is gonna be cool, and they're excited about it. So again, couldn't happen. I can stand up here and I will and say all these amazing things that are going on, you have to remember, it doesn't just take a village, it takes the heart and soul of a village to do the things that we're doing. And that's Stevens College. So, okay. Time of transformation. I'm gonna give you, teachers tell you what they're gonna tell you, they tell you and they tell you what they told you, right? Yep, so I'm a teacher. Uh, and so I'm gonna go through, and again, very quickly, and forgive me, it really is a flyby, imagine, I don't know, imagine, no, I'm not. I say, driving by billboards. I saw that, I saw that, I saw that. Um, and at the end of the drive, you will know more than you know right now. So, and I'm here for questions. So, higher education is a state of complete disarray. If you haven't been reading the headlines, search higher education closures sometime. Close to 50 colleges have closed in the last five years. Three of them are in the, either on the verge of it or have closed in, in Missouri. Fontbonne University, 100 years old, just announced its closure. Um, it is Goddard College in Vermont, where I'm from, heartbreaking, they're all heartbreaking, but Goddard is closing at the end, in two months. It is a time of uh, just extraordinary change and disruption. And institutions, higher education is famous for being traditional. You know, we're like, this is how we do this, it's the way we've been doing it since the Middle Ages, and this is how we do this. Not anymore. Mm. I skipped one, thank you. That's what I, see, I'm so impatient. Okay, one more. There we go, okay. What's the, the impact of COVID? Things were difficult before COVID. We've known for 10 years, in 2025, enrollment in college is gonna drop off a cliff. That's this coming, yes, because 25 years ago, 20, no, that's not true. Yeah, 25 years ago, People stopped having babies. Somebody last night told me that, that, that yes, thank you, told me last, that, that um, how many years ago? Like, what would it have been, 18 years ago? 2011 and 2012. 2011 and 2012, nursery school in Roma dropped off a cliff. All of a sudden, there are no two-year-olds, or three-year-olds, right? Where did all the three-year-olds go, right? People stopped having babies. And it has worked its way through the system and it is hitting higher education in 20, fall of 25. That was before COVID. So we went through COVID and right now there is a combination of factors in our culture, which I'll go through, that is influencing and informing 
18 year olds and their families that they don't need to go to college. Who needs college debt? You can just go to work, not a problem. Why? Workforce needs workers. But one of the things that came out of COVID is that everybody got A's, you know? Teachers were not going to tell those kids who basically spent a year and a half in bed, most of whom didn't even have to have their cameras on while they were attending class. Nobody was gonna flunk those kids. Kids came out of COVID with three, 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 four, three, fives. I asked last year, we had a conversation about the incoming class and what was the average grade point average at Stevens and it was like a three, six. And I said, where are all the two eights? Like, let's open the doors. Like, what? And the answer was, there aren't any. So at the same time that students were being given inflated grades, I'm sorry if you have a 4.0 student, yours is the only one who truly is a 4.0 student. <laughs> and those bumper stickers, my student is a 4.0, you go. But really, mm, not so much, not yours, everyone else's. At the same time, the colleges decided they were no longer gonna do ACT and SATs, which was the great equalizer. It, I, there's lots of arguments against those tests. I absolutely understand. But from the college's perspective, at least it was a common assessment of what kids knew or didn't know how to do. Some kids don't take tests well. I, I appreciate it. I think there should be flexibility. But there was no common metric. So at the time where everybody was exceptional, we also didn't have any kind of common, even objective, if you will, external assessment of that. So what happens is millions of kids arrived on college campuses after COVID very poorly academically prepared and very poorly socially prepared because high school really is hard. It's really hard. Remember that? It's brutal. Middle school too. But, if, but they didn't have to do that. They stayed home. And so they didn't have that maturing experience and they're having it now on our college campuses. No wonder mental health problems and concerns on college campuses have never been, oh, I say have never, my experience have never been greater. We do offer our students um, unlimited free mental health counseling on campus. Yeah, oh, yes. We do. When the labor market site, who needs to go to college? I went to a chamber event and the bank, one of the bankers in town was up showing video of his son standing next to his brand new red convertible right out of high school, got a job in town working, you know, and look, he'd buy himself a new car. I was like, okay, he can buy himself a new car. What's he going to be doing in 10 years when he's still driving the same car? Because he hasn't, anyway. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that, you're welcome. Uh, but there's this drive, right, to, you don't need college, you don't need college. So college enrollment in Missouri, this is just, again, data. You don't have to read all of it. Enrollment in Missouri has declined 23% since 2010. When we talk about enrollment at Stevens College, you have to always remember, Stevens College is in Missouri. Just for, I love Missouri. Would never have believed I would live in Missouri. <laughs> you have to be here to love Missouri, frankly, or know someone you love who lives in Missouri. I'm sorry, but that is also true. Okay, um, most of this, among Missouri residents, 21% leave the state to go to college. So we don't, you know, the pool, I'm trying to get your head around the pool. Right, you know, I love it. Alumni say to me, well, we used to have 2,400 students at Stevens, and I was like, wish I'd been here then, right? Those were the good old days. Those days are gone, and it's not just at Stevens. Those days, those, think about what else was going on when there were 2,400 students at Stevens College. Those days are gone too. So we are where we are, and we are doing an extraordinary amount of work to be and we will be one of those institutions that comes through this massive transition and is stronger, better, and more contemporary and relevant on the other side. But it's a challenge. Okay, of the, okay this, is the, this is the funnel. Of the 16 million undergraduates at all institutions in 2022, and remember, that's going off a cliff. 
3.5 million of them attended private college. Okay, 16 million, then you got 3.5 million. Okay, starting to shrink down. Okay, of that, 1.9 million identify as women. Okay, that, okay. Then, of those, a big fat 2% say they would ever consider a women's college. Okay? Then, so, so you think, well, oh, there are 3.5 million students going to college. Why can't Stevens get a measly thousand of them? Well, because there's 60% of them who are eligible and 2% of them who would, as an 18-year-old high school kid, would ever say, oh, pfft. You know, you think, well, there's so many kids who go to high school, you know, single gender high schools, right? And those are the kids who are like, I'm done with this. <laughs> of the 38,000 students who say they would be, not that they will go, they would consider it. 38,000 of them, I have no idea how many of them would consider Missouri and Stevens. Because of the women's colleges, of which there are, I think, 20 left. They say 24, but I'm sorry. Barnard is just an extension of Columbia University that's easier to get into. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> Actually, you can. It's because it's true. But that we're distributing the possibility of enrollment across all 24 <coughs> women's colleges. Again, 38,000 high school girls say they would ever even consider a women's college. And then we have Missouri. <sighs> I love Missouri, but Missouri has, has a, uh, I don't know, the headlines are never good. You know, my, my most recent favorite is a Missouri lawmaker defended child marriage, saying kids he knows who got married at age 12 are still married. I know, right? This, what? Sorry, right. So. You know, we are going to allow guns inside churches and synagogues because heaven knows. Who knows what can happen in a church and a synagogue if there's no guns? Missouri students physically resta restrained and secluded thousands of times. Missouri gets an F and Illinois gets an A in gun law scorecard. So you're a parent and you live anywhere but Missouri, so there's a lot of other places. And you see these headlines, you start thinking, well, wouldn't that be like, wouldn't that be like? And you find out they're getting married at 12 with guns. And you think, I don't know, not doing that. I'm making jokes about it because you have to laugh. But you know, the fact of the matter is, it matters. And social media matters. And when a student thinks about Stevens and her parents, and, or she, or he, because we have a co-ed conservatory, looks at Missouri, it, we, you know, uh, think about being a parent and saying, seeing the guy who thinks 12-year-olds should get married. You don't know that, that that guy doesn't live next door to campus. He's an elected representative of the state. I see those and I just think, oh my God. 38,000 in Missouri. Why is it so hard, no matter how amazing we are? This is the implications of that. If you look at we, made, we had 1,000 students FTE in 2016. We, had, we were down when I got here. There were fewer than 500. We went up, then 2013 hit, and we went down. Then we reinvented ourselves with health sciences and a whole variety of other things, and we went up every year. My goal in the world was to hit 1,000. I danced in my office when I saw those numbers. I was like, we did it. But life happens, and COVID happens. And so we are losing about 5% mm, of, of, of students a year. Um, one of the things you should know, and one of the things that separates us from other institutions, and I, we announced this, but yesterday I talked to some folks who didn't seem to know it. Um, three years ago, the college received an extraordinary gift. Um, a wonderful donor we had become very close friends with, um, passed away, and the year she passed away, I asked her for a $2.5 million gift for a project, and she gave it to us. And so after she passed away, I talked to her executor, Fred, who had become a friend as well, and said, you know, Fred, I think that Doris would have wanted you to give the college the same gift that she gave the college before she passed. And so I'm asking you for a $2.5 million gift every year in perpetuity, meaning forever. From now on, every year, $2.5 million from now on. That's a different kind of ask. 
We couldn't find anybody else who'd done that. And there was this pause, and I thought, come on, come on. And he said, I think we can do that. It took, yeah, I know. So it took two years to get the paperwork, and the board, every meeting the board would say, so, how's the gift coming? I'd be like, I got this, don't worry about it, I got this, and they were like, okay, how's the gift coming? Um, and find, we did get, get the paperwork and, and the resources, the, the funds come in in February. Um, I called Fred when I, you know, about my retirement. And he was like, you gotta come out and see me. I was like, yes, because now I want it to be five million in honor of me. <laughs> All they can do is say no. So it makes a difference. It does make a difference. You'll know the, the school of health sciences is named after Doris Spiegelberg was her name. Sharp is her name, her married name, but when she was on campus, it was Spiegelberg. So we have the school of health sciences uh, named for Doris. Um, and so again, it's not, it's not everything we need. Of course it's not. But it gives us a cushion that allows us to, con to know that we can continue to do the things and fight the good fight in a way that we wouldn't be able to uh, without it. So. People always say, what's the enrollment? What's the enrollment? Well, now you know. Okay, this, we haven't even talked about artificial intelligence and I've decided I don't have time for the video, sorry. AI, ChatGPT, Sora. If you don't know about, how many, do you know ChatGPT? Okay, everyone in the age of 18 to 35 knows about ChatGPT and basically I would wager that everyone enrolled in a college class is using ChatGPT to do their homework. And guess what, it's not cheating any more than Google's cheating. We said Google was cheating because they were supposed to go to the library and look up their own sources. Remember that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Faculty were like, you, you can't use GP, you know, you have chat, I mean, Google. <laughs> and students were like, okay. <laughs> Same thing with chat. Chat is not, AI is not cheating. It can't be because AI is what is going to be a part of everything we do. It already is. It's, and it's happening at light speed because we're prepared for it in a way that we weren't for the internet. So this is changing everything because I'm really sorry to break it to you, but they're not gonna need to know how to write. They're not. You can, you can say they, oh, that can't be true. It is so true. Why would they? You type in, this is what I need. And if you pay 20 bucks a month, you can write perfect and type in what you need. And it will move and shake and change your, your request or your prompt and give you the best answer possible that AI and it's getting better every single day there's videos that's a that's a video that that dog there's look up Sora just type in not right now okay <laughs> <laughs> but look up Sora S-O-R-A and and there is a there are videos 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 woman walking down the street in Tokyo dogs unbelievable animation beautiful scenes beautiful the waves the whatever all completely prompted. There's, you'll see at the bottom of the videos what the prompt was. And they are phenomenal. And that's, it's only been around for a year. My son, who makes movies and television, is like, well, we're done. That's it for us. And sadly, he might be right. Because why would a studio pay for 75,000 people to work on a movie and when you don't have to do that? And no one will be able to tell. So when we think about what are we teaching, we have an obligation, you know, to, to be ready now for what kids or graduates are gonna need to know in four years. Not tomorrow, not what we know now, but what are they gonna need to know in four years to be successful in a workplace that is going to be so different, so different from what it is today. They need to know how to use this as a tool. They also need to know how to talk, talk, like I'm doing right now, only better, because the writing thing not so much, but nobody can replace this. And there will still be this. We are going to become, I predict, a much more oral culture as we interpret, synthesize, critique the content that's gonna be coming out of technology. I love that. We do teach our students to stand up and speak. <laughs> and they do it. I always say we want them to be Stevens women and we don't get to pick when they do that. <laughs> but we're, we have to teach them that starting now. It can't be that. And higher education's currency is information. That's what we do. The way we teach, I know something, you don't. I say it to you, you write it down. Sometimes I'm wrong and you still write it down and put it on the test as though I was right. 
but I give it to you, you put it in your head, we hope. I test you on it, you give it back to me, I say, you get an A, you, you, because it's post-COVID, you all get A's. <laughs> That's different now, because it's not, information, knowing is not acquisition, not acquiring it, it's accessing it. Totally different. And now it's accessing it in full form. All done, polished. We, you know, I, I get letters from students and emails from students. I'm like, you didn't write this. <laughs> what? But uh, it doesn't matter that they didn't write it because it's articulating what they wanted to have said. It's a shift. So AI, oh, you think demographics is a game changer. We're just warming up. Okay, our strategic questions always, we have a new strategic plan, uh, started right after COVID. Um, and the three questions when you're doing strategy, efficient strategic planning is three questions. What do we do? What do we do, folks? What, you know, what's the baseline? What could we do? That's benchmarking and research and paying attention and best practices and data. And then what should we do? What do we do? What could we do? What should we do? Those are our questions. And that's what we did. So what do we do? Education of students of all ages and at all, we talk about students. We're redefining students. We're redefining what it means to be a student. Students at Stevens College are not 18 to 22. They, and they're all women. Our women's college is a core mission. We have a co-ed conservatory and we have graduate programs. We are expanding our definition of what it means to be a student. We remain committed to being more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Absolutely, diversity engages the full range of human difference. That means all kinds of difference. It means the whole range of what it is to be different from others. And everybody's a little bit different, but there's ways. Every student's learning experience will be characterized by teaching excellence, diverse perspectives, applied and immersive learning, and professional preparation. Those are the pillars. Those are the pillars. Oop, too fast. What's best for student learning? Not for us. Not for what we do, not for what we've always done, not for how we did, you have always done things. All of the considerations we make have to be through that lens. What is the best for our students? Experientially, academically, personally, professionally. This is about them, it's not about us. That sounds like, you know, of course it is. Mm, it's hard, it's a shift. When we're talking about scheduling, we're talking about what classes we're offering, we're talking about the kinds of experiences we offer, we're talking about where we invest. <laughs> Poor Dane, <laughs> Dane's our CFO, our Vice President of Finance and Administration, and he's responsible for just about all the operational things pretty much on campus, and I'll go in his office and I'm like, I, I think we should do this, and Dane works with me and he goes, mm-hmm, okay in the best possible way, and holds me accountable, in the best possible way. Okay, really quick, I'm gonna read this. Being student-centric means we must go beyond scheduling around the students we have, providing service to the students we have, and offering programs that better fit the students who already come. It means responding to students we don't have, service to people and organizations we don't yet know, meeting needs not yet identified, providing services and programs we haven't yet imagined, and marshalling resources and networks we haven't yet acquired. This guy, we went to visit, I'll tell you more in a minute, but we went to visit Unity College, um, and this individual, Peter, Corey, um, or I'm sorry, his name is Malik, Corey. Uh, he's eccentric, fair. We learned a lot from him. We learned a lot about what to do and what not to do. But this is a takeaway that I, I think about all the time. Okay, enrollment pipelines. This is the outcomes of what we did. And again, we'll talk about the research in a minute. These are the pillars of what we are doing. It's like, what should we do? This is what we are doing. This, the block plan, Stephen's promise, competitive athletics, cost-effective market-driven academic programs, redefining students, workforce development, mission promise kept, a beautiful sustained living and learning environment. Again, thank you to the board for three or four years ago when we came and said, we have to fix the sidewalks. We cannot keep doing this. And as so many of you have said, the college the campus looks beautiful. Again, thank you to the board who said yes, that we could invest. 
And to donors, yes, and to donors. Thank you, Anne. Of course, to donors. Of course, to donors. Thank you, Anne. That's why she's the board chair. <laughs> and tell our story. OK, let's go through these. Benchmarking and research, we did. We went, when we decided we were going to do something different, I came in and I said, at a board meeting, I said, there's this college called Unity in, in Maine, and it's gone from like 700 students to like 3,000 students in a year. And, you know, and Nikki Krawitz, who is you know, the, the world's greatest sort of accounting brain, said, that can't be right. She said, that, how did that happen? That's sort of how she talks. That's, how is that possible? So we went to find out. So the team and I went to Maine and, and to go visit Unity. And, very, Peter, I mean, Malik Peter is eccentric, has blew up his institution, fired people, moved it, changed the campus, blah, blah, blah. They're selling the campus. They're now selling the campus. The campus is for sale. He had all these big ideas. What they basically did is become an entirely environmental college, and it's all online. They've, got, they've gone from you know, well under 1,000, like well under 1,000, to 7,500 in, in three years. Turned it around. Are we going to do that? No. Are we going to be on long line? No. We're not going to join that market. But it's an example of somebody I believe is a courageous higher education leader who says, look, folks, we can keep doing what we've been doing. You know, the definition of insanity, right? You know, you keep doing it, expect a different reaction or response. We can keep doing that like most everybody else is doing, or we can blow this up and do what we can do better than anybody else. And it worked. We had a great time. We had seafood, those of us who eat seafood, um, and we did. We learned a lot. Plus, it's fun to travel <laughs> together. So we benchmarked. We looked at Colorado College. Since 1968, Colorado College has been doing the block plan. If you haven't heard of it, please take a minute and, and take a look at them. They're thriving. It actually is the wealthiest uh, family income, wealthiest college in the country. I don't aspire to that, but I like their numbers. So enrollment, they, they love it. It's the faculty decided in 1968 that they were going to do this. Um, it was revolutionary, and it's worked ever since. Six colleges in the country have adopted it. Seven. Cornell College, since 1978, has been doing this. Much, not university, college in Iowa, much more like us, much more similar to us, very um, you know, small private. Uh, and they do, they call it ingenuity, but they do the, the block plan. So we benchmarked them. We, we took a look at what they did, how they did it. We got in touch with them. We talked to, again, paying attention. What do we need to know? What, we know what we do. What could we do? This is how you answer, what could we do? We paid for a market study. We said, we're not making this kind of change without having an absolutely rigorous market study. Very long, very involved, but the takeaway for today is, well, these are the things we looked at. 2,000 prospective students, and they looked at motivations, choice, perceptions of Stevens, and knowledge of it, an interest in block scheduling. If you're going to jump off a cliff, you got to at least know you got a parachute, and there's, you know, a trampoline underneath, not concrete wall. So, lots of data. Happy to share the whole thing with you. But the takeaway is that when you ask these students whether they what they thought of block scheduling as a potential college course format, a third of them, like you look at highly, you know, highly very highly interested, and it's the ideal format. A third of them, overall, of various categories, said that they would, it was either ideal or they would be very interested. A third of anything in a market, in a statistical valid market search sample, rather, um, speaks to me. Because, again, remember the 38,000, the 2%, that you know, women's college, 2%, 38% actually trumps trumps 2%, right? If they're really interested in the block plan, maybe that 2% becomes 6% of students who consider a women's college. How can we reach students we are not currently reaching? After COVID, think about the kids you know who came out of COVID. Think about their attention span, right? Some of your educators, right? So different. The idea that they're supposed to juggle five classes at a time five different faculty members, exam week, exam week, finals week, keeping track of all those assignments. You know, we all did it, didn't we? We're not them. We're not them. You got to remember, we're not them. And parents, 
for the most part, our parents believe that somehow along the way they shouldn't have to do that. That if they're having trouble with it, you know, students today, not all, you know, not just our students, I talk to presidents all the time, like, I didn't do it. Did you, where's, you know, your assignment, I didn't do it. You didn't, why? I don't know, I just, I couldn't, I just didn't do it. There is a level of <sighs> challenge around some of the things that a five course schedule requires. So we've decided to do what our students need instead of what we are used to doing. And, and really, as an adult, do you learn best when you have somebody talks to you for 50 minutes, three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for 15 weeks? Is that how we learn? When, as adults, when you go to graduate school or you're learning a new profession, what do you do? You immerse yourself in it. You read about it, but you do it. Right. We know how humans learn. The system, the structure of education, that's, too, that's hard. It's hard to do that individualized learning for every child. But you know what? We're Stevens. And sometimes it's really valuable to be small. So, I can do anything in 18 days. Immersive, active learning curriculum, three and a half weeks. One class at a time, three and a half weeks. Faculty teach one class, students take one class. Same amount of credit hours, same amount of time in class, same amount of time in seat as over the course of a semester. It's like a summer school class, is what it's like. You know, when kids are like, oh my gosh, I'm not good at math, I'm gonna take it in summer school. Why? because they can focus on it and concentrate on it. They get it done. And you can do anything for three and a half weeks. If you love it, you love it. And if you hate it, you hate it, and it's only three and a half weeks. But it's one thing at a time. And it's not just passive learning. It is, and we are more ever than anybody doing this, it's active learning. It's immersive, active learning. Not just what do you hear, but what do you do? Okay, one course at a time, three and a half weeks, and then they get a break. There's a four and a half day break in between where they don't have anything they have to do. Think about it. You know, even over Christmas break or holidays or whatever, many of our students have homework they haven't finished. You get done with one class, you got four days, you don't have to, you're done. You're done, you don't have to do anything else. I mean, you have a job and things, but no, no schoolwork, and then you start again. And so you get the first day of class once every four weeks. First days of class are fun. Different students, different teacher, different curriculum, different experience. Didn't you just love first? I loved the first week of classes. I loved them, and then they got hard. But, and this is how this works. But you get a, you get to a fresh start every four weeks. That also works for students. Classes meet from nine to noon, and then lab classes in the afternoon. Everybody will be in class at the same time. Everybody, and they'll all be in the lunchroom at the same time. Critical mass, critical mass. At our size, you need critical mass. This will create it. And students can still take 18 credits, so there'll be four classes, 12 credits. So many of our students come into Stevens with credits. They went to community college in high school. They don't need 18 credits a semester. Many of them are fine with 12. We're also teaching year round, so they can take three terms instead of two. But they also have the opportunity to take the, the in-seat classes, the immersive classes, and then, and then take two classes up to 18 credits, which is the same as we've always done online. And Leslie's done such a great job working with a variety of different opportunities, and we've decided on one. It's a consortium of schools like Stevens that put their classes online. So we will have a wide array of online classes from other like institutions. So students will be able to take philosophy or things that, you know, all kinds of things we don't teach online. And they want some online experiences. They do. And we want them to learn online. So 18 credits hasn't changed. 12 of them in seat, the opportunity to take six credits more if they want to. Okay. Yeah. This is what it looks like, block one, two, three, four. It's just an example, you know, the dates, 24th, to the, 24th of January to February 16th, break, February 21 to March 16th, spring break. I mean, we'll have the same breaks, we'll have the same structure overall, but they'll just do it one course at a time. Benefits, greater flexibility, more terms for more points of degree entry, students can focus their attention better, and adult learners, it, they can come in and do some of these for micro-credentials, which we'll talk about in a minute. One of the big benefits of this 
is that students will spend so much more time learning off campus. We will call you and ask you if a student can come and shadow you for a week. A week, not a semester. It's hard to have somebody in your house for a semester, but a week, why not? They can come and they can, they can study what you, know, what you do. They can, with, you know, in a class or independently, they can and then come and visit for a week or 10 days and come back and debrief and that's three and a half weeks and they're not missing anything else. They're not missing the other four classes. One thing at a time. My goal, my goal in the world is that they all study, all have off-campus experiences. We're building research trips into our health sciences program. We're building creative expression experiences. We're, we're, we're opening BOGI, Oak BOGI, our summer theater program, which is 10 weeks it's used. It's a beautiful campus. Amazing, talk about donors, Anne. It has been transformed into an artist village. We have tiny homes, it's beautiful, and we use it 10 weeks out of the year. So we're gonna start using it, thank you, Mike and Ruth Ann Burke, who have been our directors and owners up there for forever, are, are actually transitioning to be up at Boji full time, year round, with the breaks that they have the right to have. Um, and so that we will have other programs, like a creative writing workshop. We'll go up and spend, a, a block at Okaboji. So we're leveraging our assets in ways we haven't been able to because they're not missing anything else. They don't have to worry about the four classes of homework they've missed when they get back. I also am determined that they're all gonna have a study abroad experience. There we go. So we have a created, Alex, Brian, and student experience. Uh, we've created a new position which is off, is study abroad cultural experiences. And we are hoping that every student will have at least one of those experiences before they graduate. There's nothing like study abroad. There's nothing like an international experience to change you forever. You just can't, you can't duplicate it. And we don't, they don't go because they've got five classes. One class at a time, they can do it. So, oh, here, oh, do cross-cultural experiences. We have one already set up, Al, uh, Scott Taylor, Chair of our business program and uh, of, of workforce development, um, and Alex Bryan just got back from Italy. Yeah, really. I was gonna go, but I'm doing more than one class at a time, so I couldn't. Um, they're gonna do global business, and so they're gonna teach a class the second block that is about global business um, and in, in Italy. And they're gonna take a cohort, a group of students to Italy for 10 days. They were like two weeks, I was like 10 days. Um, it's expensive. But one of the things I will say, donors, I'm gonna keep going back to you, um, is that we need your help because we have to make sure that every student has that opportunity. It can't be certain kids get to do that and others don't. Oh, you can't sign up for the Italy program because you can't afford to go. Again, I had a student I was talking about, we are gonna find a way to make that affordable for every student and I had a student say to me, I'm going on every one of those. I was like, no but you get to do one, so pick carefully. So these classes are open to all students, they're interdisciplinary, and this one is about business, but there's multiple ways to look at that from every perspective. Um, and so students are very excited about that, and they should be, because that's an experience that will change their lives, and they're only gonna get it if they come to Stevens. So, uh, and of course, uh, Faculty were like, well, are you gonna help us with this? And so Leslie worked really hard and brought an extraordinary, extraordinary educator to campus who's the, the director of our new Center for Teaching and Learning and is working very closely and has been working very closely all year with our faculty to help them imagine and then execute on their big ideas for this kind of instruction. Why Cornell? We've had a really close collaboration with Cornell. We've hired them as our consultants. They're amazing, they've come to campus. We've I think I have the, wait, there's, the, this is the bus of our, <laughs> Leslie took a bus load of faculty, that's not really the bus. <laughs> but it felt like the bus, right? Um, this was their, this was their, like, you know, their meme for their trip. Um, but they went to Cornell, talked to the faculty in their, you know, in their disciplines, talked to the registrar, talked, everybody had their, you know, their parallel and went and, and learned from them. And those faculty and those staff are so enthusiastic that our faculty and staff came back like, oh, 
okay. You know, they talk to students. We've also had our students talking to their students. They have been amazing role models, uh, consultants, the wise folks on this step. Uh, so we're, we've done everything we can to prepare. I want you to know, this was not a, okay, we're gonna do this tomorrow. We have spent two years getting ready for this and a thousand percent all in for the last, since a year ago at this time, bringing people along and making sure everybody feels good about it and is comfortable with it and is ready. Will there be glitches? You bet. But that's okay, because we're all learning together. Okay. Okay. Why we love block schedules. That's online. You could take a look at it. It starts in fall of 2024. Come on. There we go. Did I skip some? No. I don't think I did. Okay. The other, number two. What's the biggest problem families have about higher education? Money, right? We've been hearing it forever. Oh, the, you know, it goes up and oh, yeah. and I think, okay, listen to me. I'm not defensive, but it costs money to educate a student and to have them living here and to give them free mental health care and, and free, unlimited mental health care and internet and food and security and all of that costs money. It costs, plus, of course, because students, uh, everybody has a discount rate. Um, they don't pay the ticket price. They don't. It varies according to what they can afford. But it's still too much for so many families. So thanks to Dane and his team, who came back with this incredible proposal. Actually, one of our faculty, we were like, we had meetings like, give us a wildest idea you could imagine. And Jim Terry, who is retired, bless his heart, um, but had been here forever, and this was an art history and a relatively conservative guy, I would say, uh, said, why don't we just give free tuition? And I was like, ha, ha, ha. Well, we, I wrote it down. We looked at it. And then he didn't say anything about it again. And then Dane came back and said, well, what if we did give free tuition? What would that look like? So we created a model. And for families who have an adjusted gross income of $75,000 or less, which is the adjusted median gross income for families in Missouri and the contiguous states and Texas, they get free tuition. They have to live on campus. We are creating community here. We need a critical mass. We have our own needs. They have to live on campus. Um, they have to have a three point, what is it, Dane, three, five? 3.3, they all do, uh, they do. Um, it has been uh, a remarkable expression of and the execution of our commitment, right? We always say we want Stevens to be affordable to every student, right? We do, we really mean it, we do really mean it. And now for the first time we're really walking that talk. We are doing what we can to make sure that students who want to be at Stevens College can be at Stevens College. These are the folks, if you look at the data, these are the folks who pay the most in student loans, who take out the greatest number of student loans. The ones who, are the wealthy ones, they don't do that, and the ones who are the least, have the least resources, get the most aid. But you get to a certain point where you've got a $75,000 household income adjusted, you don't get that. You're not, you're not eligible for all of that. And so those are the families that need the help the most working families who, who aren't on either end of that spectrum. And so we are, we, are, we are walking the talk. Oh, here we go. Criteria, 75 GPA, they have to do a FAFSA and live on campus. Okay, we're investing in competitive athletics and if you haven't been watching the stars, you should be. <laughs> You know, I was the president of our athletics conference for seven years, and I watched every institution around us use athletics as a pipeline for, for enrollment. I mean, there's schools, Missouri Baptist is 100% athletes. I mean, it's just, that's what they are. And I was like, well, I don't know if it works at women's colleges. I don't, our students don't really seem into it, whatever. Turns out, you hire the right people, and they're into it. <laughs> and so we have done that, and our basketball team went to the national championship. Yay! Yay! Nancy was there! Um, and, uh, and we'll go again. Uh, Andre Bell is our basketball coach, and, and there's never been a more passionate coach. 
at, about Stevens. If you haven't had a chance to talk to Andre, talk to Andre. You'll, walk, you'll leave talking to Andre like, okay, this, this guy. Because <laughs> athletics now reports to me, not because I'm athletic, <laughs> but because it's so important to the institution. So I met with Andre three times a week, uh, the whole semester, and I never left those meetings uninspired. I mean, that guy, he's gonna get this done, and he's, you know, whatever, and I think he's, I don't wanna say he's the only one, that's not fair. Many of us thought it might be possible that we were going to be the national champions this year. He was sure of it. I'm like, okay, I know you're disappointed. There's next year. Um, I, uh, the house is being used as an admission center now, at my suggestion, and um, the other morning I walked in and there was a student there, some of you may have met her, and she's like this, this tall, right? And I was like, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Diane, whatever, and she walked around the corner and Andre was there and he went, <laughs> <laughs> right, um, yeah, he's, but because of that, students who, play athletics across sports are interested in Stevens in a way they haven't been before. We are hiring amazing coaches, we have hired amazing coaches across the board um, and we are, we are investing, speaking of donors, we are investing, oh, coaching, we're getting media attention for it of course. You can't believe how many people talk to me about my basketball team when I go downtown. I know sports matters but I've always been really kind of bitter about the Tigers. Like, everybody wears black and yellow. They don't have anything to do with it. Sorry. <laughs> with the Tigers. But I get it. We are a sports town. And people care that we beat Columbia College. I will tell you, it was twice. Ha. <laughs> and we won our first game in the, in the championship round, and they lost their first game. Ha. So. <laughs> um, the, at, the, at the athletics conference, the NAI, which is our conference, at that banquet, uh, for the awards of the year. Stephen swept the awards of, at that point. But I know, it was so great. So, we won the regular title. Andre was the coach of the year. Lauren, a freshman, was the freshman player of the year. Chu Crockett was the de defensive player of the year and the newcomer of the year. You seem to know, like, year, last year before Andre got here, we were, I don't know, I don't know, like three and 18. I mean, we, we didn't win. Nobody wanted to play us because you had to come and you, you knew you were gonna beat us. I mean, everybody beat us. I know, isn't that sad? I was like, I used to say, all I want is that they believe they could win when they get on the court. They don't have to win. I just want, to believe, want them to believe they could win. That was the goal. So in two years, we've gone from that to this. It can happen. I know. Come on. We also hired Melinda Rye Washington, who is a Hall of Famer. Uh, she was at Columbia College for 20 years. She was the winningest volleyball coach in the history of the NAI, which is our national conference. She is the daughter of a, of a uh, military general. You can tell. And she is, <laughs> and she is amazing, and our uh, athletics director, vice president, I made her an associate vice president and director of athletics because our athletics program has not been as organized uh, organized as it could be because of the way we were doing it. They were just playing, it, and she's got it. And we don't, it's a growing thing for us. We, it, she's got some idea, you know, it's a growing thing for us. Um, but being a little uncomfortable, you know, that's good. It's all right. We're doing things we hadn't done before. Some of the things she wants to do, we're like, yeah, I don't know, we'll see. But she is, she is the two of them are the right combination for sure, and they're building out our program, and we've hired a great new volleyball coach. Some of you met her, Maggie. We are building the program, and not quite from scratch. We've been having athletics forever. I know on and off, on and off, um, but it's a new day, and it's one of the most powerful enrollment strategies there is for a college like ours. Okay, what time is it? Okay. Um, Market-driven academic programs, animal behavior, Animal behavior is an interdisciplinary program that draws in, guess what, students who care about animals. Guess who cares about animals? All of them. Dogs are the new children, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> right? Um, and, and so 
We, are, we have this in place. We're the pet friendliest campus in the country. We have an equestrian program. We have a pre-vet program. We put these things all together and we have created an interdisciplinary program thanks to Dean Mike Barger who said yes first and all of the faculty who agreed to participate and Sarah Lindy Patel at the Stables and we are going to leverage our assets into an interdisciplinary experience that will prepare students for careers in vet clinics, equine facilities, animal welfare organizations, research institutions, zoos, museums, wildlife and conservation organizations and obviously pre-vet school and animal research school and, and equestrian and all the things we currently do. Um, I'm very excited about, we have a donor <laughs> who has given us the seed money for this project. We are in, in the process of looking at building a barn, building our prefab barn for the program down on the stables property, leveraging our assets. We are not doing anything with this. I mean, the stables are good, but there's a whole bunch of land over on the side of that property that we are gonna start using. Um, and we have a partnership with Warrior Canine Connection, which is one of our board members, is, on, is an employee there. They train service animals for veterans. And so we are also going to have a certificate program uh, for, for training service animals. There is 1,000 people waiting for service animals. There are 500 vets on the waiting list for service animals because they take two years to train, two years. And, and some of them don't make the cut but they make great pets. So if you need a dog, call me in two years. Um, but we're going to have puppies. And we're also going to have uh, giant Flemish rabbits because giant Flemish rabbits are the best service animal support animals for children with autism. So we are, we are we're teach, we're going to teach pet therapy. We're going to have students coming out of our psychology program and our counseling program very well versed in pet therapy, both in terms of the horses and in terms of the rabbits. And, it, and it's going to be such great social media. And guess how you get kids to come to college? Social media. So, and guess what the biggest thing people watch on TikTok? Animals. That's not why we're doing it, but it's an added benefit. Okay, come on. This is so slow. I know, you just, if I'm gonna get caught on a slide, this is a good one. I should have the live feed up here. Okay, Women in STEM Research is a program we've had in place a little bit not informally, but we've really formalized it this year. It's 10 students who, we have 10 students in each class and they have extraordinary opportunities for research uh, in preparation for mostly vet school, but any kind of uh, continuing research education. They are mentored by individual faculty. They are paid to stay on campus in the summers. They get a stipend. They work on independent research with the faculty member. The goal is that they do, um, they do professional uh, presentation posters uh, as by their second year. We have a partnership with the vet school at Mizzou, so they also work with the vet school and the faculty at the vet school. Um, but by the time they're juniors, again, doing independent research, by the time they graduate, the hope is that they're gonna have a publication with their name on it. And last year, we, it was a very small cohort, but nonetheless, I can tell you that we had a group of students who went through this program, did that kind of work, had multiple off-campus learning experiences, um, and 100% of them got into vet school, which is unheard of, because vet school is so much harder to get into than med school. I mean, so the goal is, is that we are creating women in STEM research. Um, so that program kicks off in full swing this fall. Okay, redefining, redefining student, what it means to be a student, workforce development. Workforce development, you know, they're not gonna go to college, you know what they're gonna need? Workforce development. Um, and so we, of course, are focused on serving women. Scott Taylor, who is another tornado in a bottle, um, is, is in charge of this program. He's been working, oh, I don't know, for the last 10 months, trying to build, not trying, building all of these different opportunities for us, partnerships out in the community, partnerships with business, partnerships with government. Um, he's, he's spoken to everybody from the governor's cabinet to the Chamber of Commerce, um, giving students credit for prior learning, when they, like, Mission Promise Kept, those of you who were at Mission Promise Kept yesterday, that's sort of an early version of this. Um, but we are launching oh, Women in the Trades and Construction um, in, Leslie? April 29th. April 29th. Be there. Uh, we have the first cohort, and, and again, I know I'm watching the time. Um, it's women, and it's women who typically have worked in the service sector. It's women who aspire to earning a family-sustaining wage, uh, but have not had the opportunity to do that. Uh, it's women who cannot afford 
to leave their service jobs in order to participate in something that would situate them to earn a family sustaining wage. This is so mission consistent. I hope you hear through everything we're doing. We are Stevens. We are truly deeply Stevens. This group, we've gone to the communities, we've gone to <clears throat> some of the churches in town, we've gone to the, the influencers in town, in their communities, to tell them about the program so they could recruit women into the program, so that there was trust about the credibility of the program. Um, they will, uh, we will pay them to participate in the program so that they are not losing their wages. We will provide them with their gear and their, you know, their boots and the things they need. We will, we will help them get fit if that's what they need. Uh, we have worked with many different organizations, but in particular, two, con two of the biggest construction companies in Missouri, both women owned, um, as partners on this, who are so excited about it. And we have people like, we wanna do, can we do this? They're so short of labor, but they're, 5% of, of workers in the construction industry are women. And there's a reason for that, because it's a really difficult place to work. So we're gonna go through this, we're gonna train them. We have workshops, all of that. We're gonna train them to use the tools and do the basics. I just found out yesterday, which makes me happier than anything I can tell you, is that in fact, they're gonna be in the, our workshop here in a very short period of time, because then we've partnered with Habitat for Humanity and they're gonna go over and build houses for Habitat for Humanity. So they're gonna learn while they do good. Um, it is a, uh, <laughs> it's a program that is unique. Um, they will come out of our program and, and pipeline directly into these construction companies that have, I'll guarantee the ones who get through the program, jobs at, I don't, it's at certainly a uh, starting wage, I think it's 20, 20, 28? It's 28, they'll start at 28, dollars an hour, which for most of them might even be, you know, almost close to triple what they earn. Um, and they will be in the apprenticeship program in those industries, so in those companies. So they're not supposed to come in and be able to build a house, although they might be able to. And, uh, and they'll do that for a year before they become permanent employees. But they will start to earn pension, salary, pension, and insurance the, the day they start as apprentices. And here's the thing. Here's the thing that Stevens. We have gotten a guarantee from those owners through this program, a student who comes through these programs is guaranteed that they will work the first year on an all women's crew. Because you get them in there and they can't stay. It is as hard as you could imagine it is. It just is. I wish it weren't. I'm not stereotyping. It is just impossible. And if you're a woman of color, it's exponentially more difficult. And so we're just gonna, we're just gonna have, we're taking Stevens in there like here, you didn't go to a women's college, but now you're going to, and now we're gonna keep you in that community while you get your feet under you, while you develop the confidence you need. And they may very well continue to work in, in women's cohorts, but they're, they're guaranteed that the first year. I'm really excited about this one. Okay, come on. This is a good example of, I got an idea. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all this. We're working on it for transportation as well, and we've made it, we want to teach them to be CDLs, commercial driver's license, right? And uh, obviously, and so, but that means you have to have one of those great big trucks, right? I'm like, can't you simulate it? Can we do games? No, you can't. And so we have a partnership with uh, the community college in town, and they have a great big truck and a driving space for the truck, and they're gonna let us use their driving and their truck um, to teach our students CDL, get their licenses. But we will be moving into various industries through this, but first, construction first. Okay, I'm just gonna go through that. We also thank you, Leslie, thank you, Leslie, and, and Stacy, and for everybody who's worked on this, but Leslie, we also have really innovative programs and partnerships with this, um, the schools here, the Columbia Public Schools, through our schools uh, and our faculty to provide, you know, the, oh my gosh, um, the schools are so short of teachers. It's just, I mean, you used to have to have some kind of experience in the discipline. Mm -mm. I mean, it, and so many, many of the staff and non-teaching uh, folks at, in the public schools are, are in classrooms. They ha we need them in classrooms. And so Leslie came up with this brilliant idea that we would find a way to give them prior learning credit and that we would give them the opportunity to earn their teaching degrees while they're working. So the school district is like thrilled, my gosh. Um, how many do we have in the program, Leslie? Seven. Seven in the program, we just started it. So they will continue to work, continue to get paid, 
finding a way for women to earn higher wages and become professional, more professional in their disciplines, or I'm sorry, in their workplaces without having to quit working or do something at night for five years. They, they'll be, we're giving them credit for the work they're doing is what it comes down to, but in partnership with the school district. Thank you, Leslie, it was brilliant. Mission Promise Kept, many of you were there yesterday. That was our first foray into looking at how do we better serve cohorts of women. Uh, again, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Herrera is force of nature, um, and that program uh, is incredibly important for all the reasons we've talked about, uh, talked about yesterday, but as a model for how do you help. Uh, and you know what it is? Wraparound services. Oh, I forgot to tell you, the construction is also wraparound services, which means we're providing childcare if you need it. We're providing transportation if you need it. We are making it possible for you to do this. You tell us what you need and we will make sure you get it. And that came from the vets because, you know, they can have their children on campus. They can't have their, their male partners in the dorms. I mean, they can visit, but they can't live there. But other than that, we are providing anything those students need. Sometimes one of them had their baby right after they got, and we had, and when, when the student babysitter couldn't be there, we had the baby in the, the office. And Lita, what, Lita was our step-in nanny, right? So, yeah, we, I mean, only at Stevens, right? Like, you know, somebody walks in and we go, hi, can we help you? We've got this baby. Okay, and, and, and you know what? We can be as amazing as we want to be, but if nobody knows, nobody knows, right? So we have invested heavily, um, Darrell, uh, we've invested heavily in marketing. So we've hired a new advertising agency, Yes and Lipman Hearn. Um, we love their work. Uh, they've worked for many, many, many institutions. And I'm going to show you, uh, this is a risk, I'm going to show you where we are and what we've got in terms of the next sort of presentation of Stevens. And, we haven't shown this to anybody, right, Joel? You're first, don't tell. <laughs> what? Market research. Yeah, market research. If you don't like it, don't tell me right now. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Maximum investment in marketing is what we're doing. This is, this is what you're going to see is a series of pictures. You know, we have a, a tagline. It's not, it's just a tagline. It's not the messaging. It's just the tagline. And right now we have dream up. Right? Dream up has been our tagline for a long time. We have dream, well, I'll tell you that later. Okay, so, so our new tagline is loud and clear. We hear you loud and clear. You speak loud and clear. You act loud and clear. We know who you are. You stand out because you are a Stevens woman or a Stevens student. Work with me, just stick with me for a minute. I know, this is like telling somebody what you're gonna name your child. You know, like you can't name it that. I, you can't say loud and clear. Somebody said that to me when I was seven and it really hurt my feelings, right? I, so try to just, okay. Okay, come on. Why is this not working? There we go. I'm, so the, the, you know, these are examples of the kinds of ads that we would have. It speaks to who we are and who we want our students to be. Maybe if I stand closer. Nope. It's not dead. Okay, there we go. Can you, can you forward these, Chris? Okay, I'll tell you when, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. There's the bus wrap. Oh, right, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Okay. We, ha we haven't, we don't have it yet. I was waiting to see if you liked it. Now that you like it, watch out. Okay. And here's our, this is our view book cover. This is one of the things you send out for students. Okay. 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 So that's so you like it. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh my God. Well, if you like it, everyone will like it. No, you know what? As I was putting this in here, I do this last minute. Last night, I thought, okay, Diane. 
what if they hate it? And I'm gonna, I, said, I was thinking, I would say, well, it's too late. But no. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. You learn, like you don't ask people to vote on your child's name. You learn after a certain point in marketing, you just are going to have to go for it. And we just, loud and clear, we went for it. We did ask a lot of people. It wasn't just, but, okay. This is a good example of the kind of ads that we've been sending out about the block plan. Goodbye 15 weeks, goodbye lectures that never seem to end, goodbye juggling. Starting in fall, we're doing things differently, adopting the block schedule one class at a time. You might take a study tour in Italy or climb glaciers in Iceland. Maybe you'll do an internship in New York or head to South Carolina for a full block of field research because now you have the flexibility and the freedom and we can offer grants that make sure you can do it. That's the kind of advertising we're sending out now. And our, it's, you might have heard about the FAFSA. There's a whole bunch of things going on in higher education that are making it so difficult for people who want to go to college to actually go to college. Um, but even so, in spite of that, our numbers are up in terms of deposits and, and in every category over the last year. And I really believe it's because of this. I truly do. Because we really have just started to let the world know about it, loud and clear. OK. Oh, oh here's some other examples of some ads. This is a, these, we sent out postcards about the Stevens Promise. Chris, can you do this? OK. OK. Another one. OK, can you turn that? Can you make this? This is an ad that is going out and has been out that I really like for us. Can you, can you make that work? like that too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We could do it. We're going to do it five times in a row. No, we're not. But you could. Okay. Um, a beautiful and sustainable living and learning environment going back to the board's uh, agreement and approval of our investing in the campus. Uh, going back to the extraordinary team that Dane has, uh, in and Laura Stevens, who's the vice president, uh, in executing on those projects. And man, they are not easy. <laughs> you know, it, I don't, well, has anybody ever, what's that movie with, about the house that, the black hole house? I don't remember. Oh, you know. Yeah, the money pit. Well, this is the campus pit. That's what this is. You open it up, and it turns out, oh my gosh. Right, but we keep at it, we will keep at it. Um, so let me just show you some of those pictures. Chris, you wanna go to the next one? B campus beautification, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it is, mm-hmm, yeah. It's, it, we have people who are like artists when it comes to the flowers and the bushes and the plants and the greenery. It's a beautifully traditional campus and we are doing our very best to caretake it. Chris? Learning center decking, we can't, I, this, this is, you won't understand this unless you have been here on a regular basis, but the hallway that goes from charters into the cafe area um, is also the, the, the roof there is the floor of the deck above the library, which used to have a moat. It is, I, I gotta tell you what, seriously, a moat. And we are paying for the moat, I'll tell you what. And so what was happening is that when it rains and the snows and all the rest of it, and it would get in between the tiles, it would go right through the sheath, because, you know, after all these years, and it would, and it would come through the ceiling in this hallway, right? It was, it was the most embarrassing thing about being here for me. It was like, I, we, I made the mistake of calling it the hall of shame, which caught on. And it, it, there was always buckets, it was terrible, it was terrible, terrible. We used to try to figure out how we could get prospective students from one place to another without going through the Hall of Shame, right? So we decided we were gonna fix it. Yeah. And we, that's the royal we, that's Dane. Dane went and found a, a construction company and that's been a whole saga, but nonetheless, to fix it. And so, we, and the windows were all a mess because of all the stain and the, 
whatever. So anyway, so we called it the Hall of Shame, and I thought, I am going to get this fixed. And so that's the Royal We, because Dane is going to get this fixed. <laughs> and so that's what it looks like now. It is beautiful. If you didn't know what it looked like, it's invisible. You walk, through, you walk down that hallway, and it's like it's not even there. That's what it's supposed to be like. You're not supposed to look at the hallway, but we used to look at it. So I have renamed it the Hall of Dane. Good? OK, there's the decking. There it is. There you go. And those are heated tiles, and it's got like coils, and it's all very fancy. But it means that things aren't going to melt and turn that back into anything but the Hall of Dane. OK, there's this. I don't, you don't know what this used to look like, but this used to be, look completely terrible. And we replaced the bricks, and we opened it all up on both sides. And students are like, wow, it's funny. They just don't see it until they see it. Walter, yeah, I'm sorry, Walter. Thank you, sorry, yes. So beautiful, small things matter. Small things matter. Chris, we renovated and done a lot of cosmetic upgrades. Um, we, we redid the senior hall roof, and you know what? Please look at it. It's a work of art. It has copper. They, you know, the workers were so proud of this. You know, I would come and bring them water because they'd be up there in the summer in the heat, whatever. And when they got all done, literally, they were standing there just looking at it. I went over there, and they're like, "This is." They were so proud of this. It's like museum quality. We restored, and it's, you know, contemporary materials. It's not the same shakes that it was, but it looks the same, and it is glistens in the sun. It is beautiful. Details matter. Next one. Elevators. Yes. Again, what doesn't work here? You know, it's invisible. You expect elevators to work. Every time I see an elevator truck on campus, I'd be like, oh, no, somebody's stuck in the elevator. <laughs> the elevator going up to the library, the, the penthouse, I used to really not want to have anything in the penthouse because you'd have to get in that elevator, and it would go, Ugh. And it would like chug, you know, like where you think, uh oh, right? Elevators are supposed to be invisible. You're supposed to just, you know, not even think about them. You always thought about them. So, new elevators. Oh, other way. Uh, learning center transform. I know, I know you don't care about this. This is what makes things work. And this is what costs a lot of money. Um, and HVAC replacement in the chapel, if you were at the event yesterday, you know that it was quiet. Right? And it used to sound like, ah! because the heat and the cooling in there sounded like a freight train. We used to have to turn it off in weddings so they could hear each other give their vows. I know. Money pit. I told you. I'm telling you. So all good. Next one. Oh, OK, OK. So as we go through the things that we have done, and you heard me talk about the pillars of the activities that we have been embarked upon, the commitments that we've made, the changes that we've made. I hope what you heard me say is that Stevens is remaining and becoming ever more relevant, that we are doing the work that needs to be done, that we are innovating, that we are doing things through a student's lens, that we are finding ways to become an institution of higher education, not for 2024 or even 2028, but for 2032, in which case they're going to have to do this again. We are responding to the way students learn, not the way you learned and not the way I learned and not the fact that, you know, not the way we had a college experience. I don't know about you, I didn't learn anything in college, but I got straight A's. <laughs> I learned a lot in college, but not in the classroom. That's true of ours, too, to be clear. But we are becoming Stevens again. Stevens has always done this. I still talk about the fact that, you know, in the 1940s, Stevens taught women how to fly, right? We were the university without walls. We've always done what students needed us to do. And we've always been ahead of whatever else higher education has done. We continue to do that. And the world is changing even faster. And you think about it, like, well, what's faster than World War II? OK, I'll give you that. I mean, there have been epic. What's faster than the Civil War? We were here in the Civil War. But the world is changing at light speed. Students are changing at light speed. AI is, is hitting. And you ain't seen nothing yet when it comes to change. This, the way we are teaching and learning, means that our students will have learned by doing. 
when I started this project, I asked AI, what are the things a college should be teaching students that AI won't replace? And you know what AI said? Compassion, ingenuity, creativity, intellectual uh, critique, collaboration, working in groups, communication. You know what those are? Those are the things that employers have been telling us forever that kids with college degrees don't know how to do. Soft skills, well, let's just call them the essential skills. So our students will have all of the content expertise and disciplinary expertise they've always had. But they're not just going to have been passive about that learning. They will have taken that information that they have access to, whether it's in their heads or not, or whether they're the ones who have to write the summary report on it, because they won't be. And they will have acted on it, collaborated on it, problem solved around it, experienced it here and out in the world, because they don't get out very much, our students. They live and breathe and eat and sleep and study here. And they need to be. And we had, a, when the basketball team went to Montana to go play, don't even ask me why they were going to Montana, but they did, two of the students had never been on an airplane. Yeah, think about that. It's time, it's time, it's our time to, to take these steps, to make these investments, to commit to being the institution we have always been historically. But not for when you were here for when today's students are here, but more important for when the incoming class arrives, because they will graduate in 2028 or 2027, and they will graduate. We don't do that five-year thing. And the world is gonna look different, but they're gonna be ready for it because of what we are doing today. All of that takes so much time and energy and effort and commitment and hard work and hard work and hard work and so one of the things that I have learned about uh, what we can do, we, we, we pay our employees competitively. We always can pay them more. But you know what you can give them is time. And I don't allow our employees to work remotely. I'm happy to talk about that if you want to, but the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. I don't pull that card very often, but on that one, no. So what I can do is make sure that they have a little bit more time. So for, for many years, we have had what we call summer hours in, in the colleges, because students, more of them are here, but not very many, and the faculty aren't here, and so we would close offices at one o'clock on Friday afternoon. And so it was like a little bit longer time, but it was like 10 weeks, 11 weeks. I did it the, first, the second year I was here, I did it. Thought I'd do it as an experiment, and the second year they came back and said, so, you know, Cheryl Brady used to work here and she was always the, the messenger and she'd come walking in and she'd say, so, are we gonna do that summer hours thing, right? And the second year I was like, yeah, yeah, we can do that and let's sort of figure it out. So the, the third year she came in and said, so when is that summer hours thing gonna start? Because, <laughs> you know, you can never take anything away. And so it became, you know, a, a, a tradition, it, an expectation. And in December, um, I made the decision that we were going to do that year round. One of the things we found out is that when, when people know that they, their school is, the offices are gonna close at noon on Friday, they get their work done. They absolutely do. And you know, I will also tell you that year round, Friday afternoons is not the most productive time on campus anywhere. So we found no loss of productivity, nobody missed deadlines, there was no issue. So at the holiday party in December, I announced that we were going to, we were going to go to a 36 hour work week. So you get paid for 40, but you're gonna work 36. I have never, well, except for when I announced my retirement, <laughs> but I've never gotten a standing ovation like the one I got. <laughs> I was like, really, this is all it took? But so we have, and it, it, it's some small recognition of what they have done and what they are going to have to do in order to do the things that we've been talking about. It takes the heart and soul and commitment and hard work of every single person on this campus. And that includes our facilities folks and it, all, everybody, their security, everybody has to buy in and step up and change the way they think about what we do. 
And I can stand here and say, we're going to do this, and we, I get to show you the slides, and isn't this great, and don't you love that ad, and I'm glad you like the brand. But they're the ones who make it happen. And so we're doing this for them. I had a facility, you know, one of the facilities guys was out in my yard, and I uh, no, he was in the office changing, fixing a light, and I said, you have to go. It's, it's noon. It's Friday. It's noon. And he, he said, I can't believe that I work somewhere where I get paid for 40 hours and I only have to work 36. I'm going to work here forever. I was like, that's why we do this, right? Thank you. So that's what this is about, and it is a small token of this institution's gratitude for what our folks do every day. One more, I think. OK, these are the things. Block plan, Stevens Promise, new off-campus study opportunities, international faculty-led programming, certificate programs, competitive basketball team, another year of significant investment, and a 36-hour work week in the last 18 months. <laughs> and here's what I would tell you. Couldn't happen anywhere but here. Couldn't happen. There was, this is an institution that cares first and foremost about students. And we all knew that those numbers were, were a problem. You know, it's an incentive. I'm not going to tell you it's not. But so many institutions around the country are doing what they do only better. That's the, the response as well. You know, we're a business school. We're going to get better at being a business school. Or we're, we're going to do this more. Or, and you know, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. And so Stevens is doing, again, what it's always done. And we've done it with the support of our faculty, our, this amazing team I have. I could never do this without this team. Wouldn't do it without this team. The board that says yes first. The students who started out like, what? What? Oh, OK. OK. If the faculty are in, the students are in, which speaks to the faculty. All of our employees our community, our donors, and all of you. All of you who are here, who've come to reunion and are sitting here listening to me talk for an hour and, ooh, long. Sorry, I'm way over. That's OK. It'll have to be, because it's already over. Uh, <laughs> I'm so happy to have you here. I'm so happy that you like the brand. I'm so happy that you're enthusiastic about what we're doing for the good of this institution and its future. And I'm so happy that you're Stevens. Thank you. Oh, another one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We got this. <laughs> Thank you.